I'm working full-time as a teacher in Norway. I was absolutely hooked by the crop circles in 1996. That's when I started looking into it. And I came down here to England to see the first crop circles here in 1999. And after that, I've, I've pretty much been here every year. Um, let's see. Um, I'll start with telling you about the only crop circle I ever discovered from the air. Uh, I am flying to take a few aerials uh, when I can, just for the thrill of it. Um, but once in 2008, I was flying to photograph a crop circle near West Woods, to the south of West Woods. Then I saw there was something in the field to the, the north of West Woods, and um, we flew over there, and it was this formation. And um, I think I was certainly the first one to see it from the air, and I might have been the first one in it as well. And looking at the photographs afterwards, I got this strange feeling, you know, that there were four eyes looking at me, and I, 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 this sentence came to me, under four eyes with the crop circles. Is that an expression in English as well, under four eyes with someone? It means sort of an intimate conversation in, uh, in Norwegian. Um, so, um, sometimes, um, you know, when people ask me all the time when I hold lectures in Norway, they ask me who are making the who or what are making the crop circles and, and how and, and why. And uh, sometimes I'm saying that if we ever get the answer to that question, who or what is making the crop circles and, and why, um, I think we will have totally forgotten the question uh, by that time because if we get that, if or when we get that answer, I think our way of looking upon ourselves and the universe and our place in the universe will totally have changed. Will have changed so much that questions like that will be, seem uh, silly in a way. So um, I have the feeling that the, the crop circles uh, uh, are there in a way to show us that we are something else than more than we think and the universe is different than we think and our place in the universe is different than we think and far, far more greater than we can imagine now. And um, I'll get back to that a little bit at the end of the talk. So in, um, in 2010, I came out with a book in Norwegian uh, because everyone was asking me when I was lecturing in Norway, isn't there anything we can read about the crop circles in Norwegian? So I decided to, well actually I came out with a small book first in 2004, but that was much too small and simple, people wanted to read more, so I came out with this bigger book, uh, which is actually this one, in 2010. And then I realized with all the work I'd put into it that it is a bit silly that it's only available to the Scandinavian uh, readers and I decided to have it published in English and I actually found a publisher, Wessex Books. So that was very nice. Um, the reason why I'm showing you the Norwegian cover is for the crop circle that is on that cover. I insisted that we had that one on the cover at the time, but the English publisher wanted a newer one. But when I came, that crop circle was in the field next to Windmill Hill in, in I think it arrived the 30th of June 2006. And I was then still in Norway and I saw this wonderful formation um, on the internet and I thought, wow, I'm really looking forward to go and see that when, when I go to England in a few days. I came over in, in the beginning of July like I normally do and then it was cut. It had been cut after only, I think, two days after it came. And I was so, it was so sad and I stayed in, in Avery Troslo also, so it was close to where I was staying, and I went up to visit it anyway, and I sat in the sad remains of it, the stubble on the ground there, and I made a sort of a, a, a prayer or a meditation, and I said, please, couldn't we have this one again, please? I would so much like <laughs> to, to see it. And then uh, a couple of days passed, <laughs> and this happened at Savannah Forest. And I was, I was really amazed that because I, it has the same components, doesn't it? And I thought, wow, it was, was sort of an answer. But then only a couple of days after that, this came as well. 
at Auburn. And um, then I was quite convinced that, yes, thank you. I was allowed to, to, to really experience and see this pattern for real anyway, not only on a photograph. And it is, um, these designs were referred to as wormhole designs. And uh, there was a lot of, oh, we, we talked a lot about it back then in 2006. Why are they repeating these wormhole designs this year? And um, I don't know if any of you have seen the film Contact, based on the novel by, by um, uh, what's his name again? Uh, Carl Sagan, yes. It's a wonderful book, and, and, and the film is amazing. Uh, it is about... Uh, uh, a signal coming in, you know, being, being um, received here at Earth from, from, from beings in outer space, and uh, the, the, main, the main role is, is uh, the main character is then to, to travel out into the universe because there are instructions in this signal to build a big machine, and we assume it is uh, uh, to send people, being, you know, it's to, uh, its function is to send people out into the universe in a capsule. And so this uh, main character uh, is, uh, is doing that, but from our perspective, she goes nowhere. The whole thing, the whole machine is a big failure. Uh, nothing happens. Uh, the, the capsule doesn't go anywhere. And, uh, but when she comes back, she's a scientist, she's an astronomer. She's telling about the most amazing experiences. She went for a long journey through the universe, through wormholes. And uh, Everyone is just, you know, shaking their heads, looking at each other and saying, okay, now she's gone nuts. So uh, she then has to realize as a scientist that she's made some kind of spiritual journey or maybe, um, maybe uh, a, a journey in, in, other, in other dimensions or other, in, a, in another existence in a way. And uh, it, it makes uh, life real tough for her, but she's, she sticks to what she's experienced. And uh, uh, finally, they, they sort of believe her and start sending other people also on the same journey. And that is the, the start for humanity, an, a new beginning for humanity in a way. So I, I sort of feel that applies to the crop circles as well. You know, that, that they start sending us on a journey that we cannot, we cannot really figure out what it is if we only look at, uh, uh, at the crop circles in a physical manner, trying to, st that is, it is interesting, studying them on the ground, looking at the patterns and, and so on, try to figure it out. But there is something, there is something uh, else going on as well with us when we look into the crop circles. And, and I'll, at the end of the lecture, I'll read a little passage from the book, and so we'll get back to that. Uh, even one more, wormhole design appeared in 2006. Or at least that's, it, it, they weren't as typical as, as the first one, the first ones, but everyone assumed they, it was a wormhole design as well. And then I stumbled across, as I was writing my book, I stumbled across uh, um, a drawing, a, des a design that looked very much like this, and that it that was a four-dimensional forest I was told. A thorus, uh, uh, we'll get back to that. This is the thorus, uh, a, a donut. Um, I, I saw that drawing in a book, and not this one, uh, but I went to a website. Uh, I, I finally found it on the internet, and it turned out that this design had to do with a thorus. Because if we try to imagine that we can creep inside the thorus, inside a donut, it will look a little bit like this. And if that is folded out, made flat, that's the design you get. This is from a, a website about, a, a mathematical website called Brown, um, Mathematics Brown dot um, edu, education, I think. It's, it's uh, I refer to it in my book. So that, I was very amazed. This was a few years afterwards. That, that is probably what that pattern was referring to. And I'm no mathematician, so I, I cannot really explain to you what a four-dimensional thorus is, but maybe someone can pick this up and, and look at it a bit closer. But it certainly reminds, it reminds a lot, doesn't it? It is quite similar to this one. But there's something in the middle here, uh, a diamond shape, which is not in the crop circle. 
And then on the 15th of August, this design arrived at Achilhampton Hill. So I sort of, I was wondering, you know, if that had, had anything to do with it. Are you still counting, Michael? Sorry. We're you counting something. 10 by 10. 10 by 10. I know you know a lot about the Thors, so you should look into this story. That's as, as far as my ability goes with this. Anyway, uh, I'll just tell you a little bit about the book and give you some highlights from it, I thought. Um, the book aims at uh, presenting the crop circle phenomenon in a thorough and, and you know, in a broad way with, with emphasis on facts. But I also want to you know, allow unconventional views and theories. That is, that is important for me. But I want, I want also a skeptic to be able to read this book and to get something out of it. So the, the contents are you know, about the crop circles. What are they? What do they appear? Where do they appear? I, I treat the historical perspective, and I am quite proud of one of the chapters, which is only of eyewitness accounts, which I have a few, about 50 of. Um, I don't think there's been, uh, you know, they, they have been all around in magazines and on the internet, but I thought it was nice to put them together, make them available. And then I, there's a chapter about light phenomena, and there's a chapter, a whole chapter about crop circles on the ground, which I also find important because many people think crop circles are only flattened plants, flattened corn, uh, and there's so much more to see on the ground, so, so much beauty. Um, and uh, there's a, a bit about the science and the research and about who or what is making the crop circles and what do they mean, the, the patterns, the geometry, and so on. I wanted to put in my book this uh, sentence, you know, people who say all crop circles are man-made simply demonstrate that they know too little about the phenomenon. Because that, that is what I think, that my publisher advised me against it. They thought it was a bit um, too cocky in a way. So I, I but that is what I, I believe, really. You, you, you just prove that you know too little if you say that. So I'll then go through uh, just a couple of highlights from uh, the book. I was asked to, to show you a few examples of Scandinavian, Scandinavian crop circles. So um, we have a very early re report in Norway that we received a few years ago from a, a, an old woman who visited this crop circle as a 10-year-old. And uh, I'm a teacher, so you have to excuse me for this, but I'm, I'm showing you on the map uh, about where it is. I always do that. <laughs> uh, uh, so, um, oh, what's happening? All right. And then another um, crop circle. We don't have any photograph of the first one, you know. It's only what she drew. As she drew it like this. But it was quite, quite an exciting story, and, and her uncle, who was a farmer, told her then about this. Uh, he called them um, uh, field circles, I think. That happened every now and then, and it was a known thing to the farmers in the 50s in Norway, at least um, in that part of Norway. That's quite interesting. Uh, and then we had quite a beautiful little formation in 2007, uh, which was a uh, simple design, but very beautiful on the ground. That was also here in eastern, eastern Norway, quite far south. Very, very beautiful on the ground. No damage to the plants whatsoever. Completely pristine, fluffy, wonderful. This was taken the, the morning after. These photographs were taken the morning after it was discovered. And then there was a very strange thing in 2009 in a, in a very sloping, hilly field uh, with uh, half-ripe uh, oats. It was a very strange crop and a very strange field, but a, quite a big design for, for a Norwegian crop circle. That was also here, not far from Oslo. And, and the lay was so beautiful. It was flowing like water, and it was quite high as well, about 10 centimeters above the ground. The farmer was furious, threatened to kill me if I tried to go into it, but I still did. I crawled in. I crawled in and took these photographs. <laughs> he couldn't see me among, among the plants when I entered the field. 
Um, and here it is, the very hilly field with uh, the river below there. And then I want to show you a particular Swedish crop circle, an, an old crop circle, an old one from 1994. We only had, there was only two photographs of it. It's this one and a close-up of the stalks. And I find it amazing. I didn't go and see it, of course. It was before I was interested in the crop circles. But look at the way the plants are laid down. And not only the, 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 the beautiful flow, but look at how it all, the lay all stops here. It, it means it has gone down as a sort of a fan, hasn't it? A fan that is opened. And um, I got these photographs, that's a close-up, yeah. I got these photographs from uh, the, um, uh, the, the leader of the, the Swedish UFO organization. It's called Klaus Svan. And he has written uh, a book uh, about UFOs where he's dedicated a few chapters to crop circles to convince people they are all man-made. That's the whole, the whole, his whole mission. He thinks they're absolutely rubbish. But suddenly, in one of those chapters, he's showing, he showed a little black and white version of this photographs, photograph, and I went, wow, when I saw it. And I asked him to, if I could use it, if he would give it to me, and he did. And he said, well, I must admit, this is the only time I've, I've wandered, I've stopped a bit and wandered, you know, and I don't think this could be made by people, he said. Uh, also, I've been asked to, to say a few words about formations in snow or ice, off or in snow or ice, actually, because I want to tell you about a, a very strange ice formation in Norway that happened in December 2003, which was, uh, this is a still from a video, and it's very bad because it's almost dark. Uh, it was on a field. There was no snow there at the time. It was on a field of, of withered grass. And it was a relief of ice. That was quite a bit further up north in Norway, in the district here. Uh, and it was discovered by three children. It was very close to their schoolyard. And they, they saw it during a break uh, uh, between the lessons. And they were so amazed uh, of what they saw because they had just been standing there in the break talking about the film Signs. It was a silly movie about crop circles at the time that they wanted to see, but their parents wouldn't allow them. They were only 12 years old. And then the, this girl, uh, uh, Victoria, she looked over her shoulder and she saw this thing in the field. And they were all so amazed. And uh, they wanted to go and have a look at it, but um, the bell rang and they were going to have a math test, so they had to run. Then after the school lessons, after the school day was over, they went back to the field and took a closer look at it, and they realized they had to, to run home. It was getting dark then at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, quite far north in Norway. They realized they had to uh, run back to, to Victoria's house and, uh, and fetch a video camera, and so they did. They, they stole her father, got her father's uh, video cam camera without permission, and they went back again to the school area, and they filmed as they walked the formation. And this is a still from that moving, very, very moving, you know, uh, the camera was moving all the time because they were walking. Because what happened was that when they came up to the formation, up close, the camera stopped working. They could, it wouldn't work anymore. And um, then they looked at it and they said it was a relief of ice. The corridors were about 20 centimeters wide, they say, and it was about fi five centimeters high, the relief the ice corridors, and it was on a sloping field, and the temperature in that area that night was only uh, about zero freezing point, and it's very difficult to understand how a pictogram, a relief of ice, could freeze in a field in, in that fashion. No one understands that. Anyway, uh, they, they, were, they, thought they were a bit afraid, you know, of what uh, Victoria's uh, father would say because they broke the camera the video camera. So they took it to a shop. Uh, uh, they were sure the battery was full because they had j taken it out of the plug. You know, the battery was charging when they picked it up. And the man in the shop said, it's destroyed. The battery won't charge again. It's, it's completely destroyed, so you would have to, you have to get a new battery. So that was quite, quite amazing. Similar stories that are, have been happening in crop circles also. Um, just the same, the same afternoon, 
early evening, it started snowing, and the next day, uh, the, 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 the ice pictogram was covered by uh, 30 centimeters, of a foot of snow. Then it, so, but they brushed the snow away and could see it was still there, but then they couldn't photograph it anymore. But in, there was a, a mild period in um, February, and then it partly melted out again. Well, here it is. There's a reminiscence of it, but now it looks quite different. From, it was very sharp and, and nice when they discovered it. So that is probably the most extraordinary ice formation that has ever been, at least in, in Norway, and, and I've never heard about anything like that before. And there's actually a whole group of people meditating on that spot every now and then in that area because of that story. So it made quite an impression on a lot of people. Uh, there are also formations in snow and ice other places in the world. There's been some amazing cases in Russia of, I think this one is a spiral. This is most certainly a spiral. This is, those photographs are taken from a newspaper article. It was in 2004, and this spiral covered uh, the playground of a, of a kindergarten. Suddenly, one morning when they came out. Um, very amazing. No one had an explanation for it. Spirals of snow. And then there was another story in 2007 with, I think these are concentric wings, not a spiral. It's difficult to see, but I think so. Covering quite a big area. And on my website, uh, you saw it uh, in the beginning, cropcirclesnorway.com, I have a section that I've called Related Phenomena. And there, I think I have a, a, a quite a large collection, uh, one of the best ones in the world, uh, with examples of snow and ice formations. So if you want to, to see more of it, you can, you can access that website. And I thought I might also uh, show you an example, a very strange example of a ghost formation. Some of you may recognize this wonderful uh, crop circle that happened on uh, Oliver's Castle. Uh, Oliver's Castle is the, the, the earthwork here um, uh, in August 2008. Very beautiful formation. I was sent a photograph in January how, you know, a person had been flying and had taken this photograph from the air. There was a tiny bit of snow then here in England. And the formation came out again like this. And I, I tried to ask people, can you please go there and see how, what, what, what is there on the ground? Is there only, uh, is it, has it been plowed or is there stubble? Uh, they said it had been plowed. But uh, I'm not completely, you know, I, I don't know the people. It was just secondhand information but how the snow either didn't settle in the same pattern as the crop circle or melted. It, it is very strange. And also, the next year in, in um, well, you can see the similarity of the crop circle and the, the pattern in the snow. And next year, the field looked like this. Then there was wheat. The, the, the formation in 2008 was in wheat, and there was wheat again. And then it looked like this. This is a, is a more common uh, ghost formation, I think, uh, type, when, when you can see it in the crop the next year. And it might be perfectly natural explanations to that, uh, that, that the, 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 the crop was a little bit different uh, last year than, than it is this year. I don't know. Might also be a more mysterious explanation for it. Uh, the historical aspect, as I said in my book, I'm trying to, to, to cover that in, in detail. And I've been asked also specifically to give you some examples of uh, eyewitness reports. I was really uh, thinking a lot about how to present them to you because it is not very, it's not, there's only text, you know, it's nothing I can show you. So it's a bit, I'm afraid it's going to be a little bit boring, but just tell me if you want me to stop. I think I have three or four examples. In the book, there are 42 reports from direct witnesses to crop circles forming. Some of them very short, only a couple of sentences, and some very detailed, over a couple of pages. Uh, and I've also included 19 observations of wind and light phenomena that seem to have caused crop circles. People saw lights above a field or in a field, and then they went over there uh, and they discovered the crop circle. So we must assume, maybe it can assume that they, 
the light had something to do with the creation of the crop circle. And then there are uh, a few reports of crop circles that have been documented to happen in a, in a very short period of time. Um, I was, um, I, I, just, I chose to do it this way, you know, um, just to show you the, 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 the basics, the basic uh, sort of uh, uh, the experience that Kathleen Skin had uh, in Cambridgeshire in 1934, her, her points in a way. She was gazing, she, he, it's a long story. She was gazing over a wheat field. She was sat down in, in, in the shade of a hedgerow. It was a very hot day when she heard a crackling like a fire, she says, and she saw a whirlwind in the center of a the field right in front of her and it was forming a crop circle as she watched. Um, the whirlwind was spinning stalks and seeds uh, and dust into the air for 100 feet or more, she says. And within seconds, the whirlwind had left the circle it had just made and was traversing the field. And um, she, she entered the, the circle and found uh, a perfect circle of flattened corn. The stalks were lying clockwise they were interlaced and their airs lying on top of each other and plated uh, on the periphery. And the air was very hot, she said. It seemed hot and she could feel the warmth of the crops of, of the, the flattened stalks through her shoes. And when she touched the lying wheat with her hand, the, 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 the crop was almost too hot to touch. And she then, while she was in the first circle, she observed the whirlwind reaching the corner of the field and creating a second circle there, four, four meters in diameter, 1934. And this, as you see, this uh, experience she, she sent in a letter to uh, the Sunday Express. Quite amazing, one of the most beautiful uh, stories, I think. And then there's another example I thought I might show you from, from Germany. This was... Uh, this was uh, uh, a story that came out in an interview Andreas Miller made with, uh, with a person, I think it was in 2000. But it happened many, many years ago when this um, person was only 11 years old in 1946. He was walking from a, a little town called, uh, or a village called uh, Welsbang. He was walking north toward another village called uh, Süderfahrenstedt. Uh, it was a warm day, there was no wind, and then when he was one kilometer north of Welsbang, uh, he he heard a whistling sound and he saw the bushes swaying. And then 25 meters to, to his left, over the field of oats, he saw a three meter wide and 18 meter uh, uh, high uh, column of uh, plant debris spiraling counterclockwise. And then, his, and then there were four smaller columns spinning clockwise, surrounding the first. Uh, one of the smaller columns, he, he, he's, he's, he's saying, collapsed, and the three others merged with the central, the main column. And then the whole thing rose up into the air. Uh, and then there was a brisk wind, he's saying. It blew in all directions towards the, the disturbance, towards the, 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 the column. He made his way through the crops and found one central and three smaller sharply defined circles with a central cone of stalks wrapped loosely uh, around each other. And the collapsed column, the one that collapsed one of the four uh, in the periphery, had only left a faint trace. It didn't finish the job. So that's another example of, a, um, of an eyewitness account. And then there is a quite interesting one from 1989 in, from Scotland, where a natural, naturalist, I don't exactly know what that means, but someone who's studying nature, I guess, uh, he had for many years studied foxes and their habitats in the Tayside area in Scotland. And an early morning, he followed a trail on an embankment between two fields. Uh, and he had a good view into a sloping field of barley. He then heard an, an unusual noise and a violent rustling in the corn. And a few meters away, the corn in a circular area, uh, area was being buffeted in a highly localized movement of air. That's his exact words. Uh, by the way, this was an interview that Terence Meaden made with him in November 1989. 
And after half a minute, the cone went flat, forming a circle of 15 to 18 meters in diameter. And when, as he entered the circle, he felt an unusual, an unusual condition of the atmosphere, he says, and he experienced a peculiar sens sensation in the air. Yeah, everything had gone quiet, and the birds had stopped singing. And when I read this, I, I was thinking about a story uh, uh, that is also in the book by, by Charles Mallet. He once was in a crop circle, and then a ball of light appeared. And he said almost exactly the same. Everything went quiet, and there was a strange sensation in the air. That ball of light did not make a crop circle, uh, but it, it was there for a couple of minutes and then disappeared. Um, Charles Mallet's ball of light. So here there's, there, there's an example of uh, just wind, and there was the columns, and the first story was, 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 was uh, small whirlwinds. And then uh, in 1991, at Eastfield, maybe some of you know Winston Keach, he actually uh, watched a crop circle happen as well. It was in the early morning, he'd spent the night uh, at, uh, behind a hedge at the edge of Eastfield, when he saw a pale luminous disc the size of a dinner plate above the crop. And the disc traveled slowly across the field, and then it started expanding to approximately six meters and became stationary, only 15 meters in front of, of uh, Keach. And the crop beneath the disc then uh, shook and rattled and fell. It only took about three seconds. And then the disc moved away again across the field while it was contracting. And he entered the place and found a circle approximately six meters in diameter. And He's told me that that's, uh, I, I was um, interviewing him about this story in 2009, and he then told me that's what made me nuts, you know, that hooked me completely. I had to figure out what the crop circles are. And he spent uh, many, many nights on field watch, watches after that on the hills here in Wiltshire, being deeply involved with the, in the crop circle phenomenon. The last story I'm going to show you is uh, one that happened in, in um, Wisconsin, in the United States in 2003. Uh, <clears throat> an Arthur Randaller uh, in, the, in the morning observed from his kitchen window that it started raining and the wind picked up. And he noticed that the bark was flying off a tree about 10 feet in front of his window. He then leaned out of the window and saw across the road, how a group of trees started swaying every which way, saying. And in a wheat field behind the trees, he saw three circles forming, one by one, over 12 to 15 seconds. There was nothing unusual in the sky. There were no lights. There were no unusual sounds or odors. Um, and um, three weeks later, BLT sampled the formation, and, and they found plenty of elongated and exploded nodes. And there was also a strange incident um, later when um, uh, Todd Lehmeyer, or Lehmer, I don't know how it is pronounced, from Michigan, the Michigan UFO Association, visited the formation. He, he then saw a man in a, a camouflage uniform, a special Air Force, a US Air Force team, who inspected the field, and he talked to him. And he said, oh, he explained how they were very interested in the crop circles. That was, that was quite, there's photographs and, and, and de more detailed uh, information about it in the book. So I, um, I thought those were the, the five examples I would give you. There are many wonderful stories. So um, I think you'll enjoy reading that section in the book. And then we need something a bit more um, with some beautiful images again, don't we, after all that text and all that talking. So I thought I would show you some formations, or some British ones that I've found remarkable over the last few years. Uh, I think the most beautiful formation that I've ever seen on the ground is the one uh, a couple of friends of mine and, and myself managed to finally find in Garsington outside Oxfordshire, Oxfordshire in 2005. 
this aerial photograph had been on the connector for or only that section actually for 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 a week or two and and no one there were no ground shots and no one had been able to find it on the ground and then we decided a Norwegian friend of mine and and a, an Australian that was here that we would go and, and try and try to locate it and we searched and searched and searched but it turned out the the map location was uh, on the connector was quite wrong and we'd given up actually when we went to the next village the villages there were on, on the top of the hills in, in the Oxford area and we looked over our shoulders and we suddenly saw something in the field back where we had been and so we were then able to drive back and, and, and visit the formation and that was really amazing. Um, the first big circle looked like this. Uh, these um, sort of um, spirals, three-dimensional spirals of corn, they're very, very fragile. If you try, we couldn't walk into it, you know, because if we only touched it, they would collapse. And um, there were one circle after another, you know, with these beautiful spirals. And then there were two incredible ones where all the stalks had been pushed inwards like this. This one and, and then a small one at the end. And then at the bottom of the field, a bit away, there was this tiny little thing and then these two amazing circles with this really, really beautiful lay. We, this was late in the evening, as you can, can see from the light maybe, and we then went back to Wiltshire and we, we told everyone about, and we showed them the photographs and everyone wanted to go up there the next day. But then it was really, uh, there was a, a, a torrent of rain so they had to wait, I think we were there on a Sunday, they had to wait until Tuesday. And when they came up there and found it, it was all collapsed. So it was really nice that we were able to find it and, and, and to take these photographs. And then I thought I would show you an example of a beautiful um, rapeseed formation. I haven't seen too many rapeseed formations because it's difficult for me to get away at that time of the year and to go down here only for a short weekend is uh, um, a bit uh, too much normally, but I have done it a couple of times. And uh, in, in 2009, I saw a couple of wonderful examples of rapeseed formations, and particularly this one at Morgan's Hill was amazing. On the ground, it was completely immaculate. It was so beautiful. The plants, as you see, it was a few days old when I was there. They were completely undamaged, still flowering as beautifully as the standing ones. And the stalks were, had no damage whatsoever, completely pristine. And they were all bent at ground level like this and, and had stiffened in that way. So um, you should come, if, if you have the chance, you should try and come here during springtime and look at rapeseed formations, they are really, really beautiful. And then uh, in 2009, when I'd been here for four weeks and the day I was to, to or a couple of days before I were to go home, uh, there was a report of a formation at Winterbourne Bassett. And it was in the morning and we hurried out as we normally do. And when we came over there, we were so sad to see that it had already been cut. But there was this little thing at the corner of the field, which was, well, this was an aerial I took a, a couple of days later when I flew over, quite sad. Nothing left whatsoever. And we were really wondering what the pattern might have looked like. Because this little thing at a, the, the, the corner was so beautiful. And then um, it turned out someone had taken a ground shot, actually, in the early morning before it was cut. And through uh, stretching it, it is able to, you know, it is possible to see the pattern. And so uh, it was probably something like this. And uh, amazingly, another formation arrived later in the summer, which had sort of repeated the same pattern. And who knows, maybe the first one had this amazing ground lay as well. But that's probably a bit how it looked. And then, on my last day here, in the 31st of uh, July in 2009, 
and in the early morning, there were reports of three new formations, and I was able to fly quite early at about half past eight in the morning. And we came over here, over to that cut formation, and there was the new one right next to it. <laughs> so it wasn't the same pattern, but it was still there, so close. And the farmer came, you know, when, when we were... When we came out of the field again, he was so furious. He was absolutely going completely crazy. He was afraid he would die of a heart attack here, there and then, you know. He, he thought we had made it. <laughs> and uh, he was so furious by the fact that they had just cut out one and another one arrived. So, um, but I thought that was quite, quite nice in a way, you know, so that he could see that it doesn't help to cut them out. Uh, that was how it looked. Very beautiful. And then that summer in 2009, there were another example also of a formation that was probably replicated. Because a formation arrived at the Stone Avenue the 17th of June. And before anyone had the chance to see it or photograph it from the air, it was destroyed by the farmer. So this is all people got to see looked very, very sad. But then uh, there were developments. The 18th, it, it looked like this. It was sort of, uh, the, the, the cut through crops were flattened and then it was repaired, you know, with something around it and with a tail. And in the 19th, there were two other, uh, as another extension, another circle and two rows of circles as well. But then it looked kind of attractive again, quite nice. So I thought, well, the circle, uh, creating force, uh, didn't want us to miss that one, so uh, they made it look pretty again. But then this one happened, the 1st of July, on top of Waden Hill, right next to the Stone Avenue. Really a beauty. Uh, this is Lucy Pringle's photograph of it. Very, very beautiful. And uh, uh, I came a couple of days after. It still looked wonderful on the ground. Um, and then, and from the air, it's right next to where there is a formation now at Waden Hill, by the way. And then I received an email from a Norwegian woman called uh, Christy Halvorsen. She had actually been walking that morning, and she'd taken a, a ground shot of the first, the Stone Avenue uh, formation, before it was cut. And by stretching the image, it seems that this beauty on Waden Hill, the 1st of July, was uh, a replica of the destroyed one. So the circle making forces decided not only to make the, the, the cut one look pretty again, but actually to rematerialize it, to make it once again for us. That was, that was quite nice. Um, a, a, couple of, a couple of other formations and some incidents. Uh, last year, um, as she has been doing for the last three years, Monique Klinkenberg, who is sitting over there, flew almost every morning to photograph, to, to inspect the fields, to see if there were any new formations. And um, she flew this morning, the 25th of July, 2011, and she discovered three formations from the air. Uh, one of them was right beneath the Roundway White Horse. These are her photographs, by the way. And she phoned me and asked if I was in for an early morning hunt, you know, uh, to go try and go and find all of them on the ground and uh, look at them. And for some reason, I decided to do this one first. I hadn't seen the, um, the aerials. I just, we, we decided I would go and, and, and see this one first. And as we entered uh, the edge of the field here, uh, uh, a tractor with some device at the back arrived. And I thought, oh no, this is the farmer. And we were climbing the gate when he came to open it. And I just ran. I ran, it was quite a distance from over here, all the way into the formation. I beat him, I was there before the tractor. And I started <laughs> photographing like crazy. All my photographs, almost all of them were blurry because I was so, I ran so fast and I was so nervous. But I managed, you can see in the aerial how amazing the ground lay was. And I managed to get some decent photographs at least. It's quite horrible because as I was doing it, he was starting to cut it from the periphery and in, inwards. So it was very, very sad. And, but at least 
we comforted ourselves, Monique, that you got the aerial and I got some ground shots. So uh, it was documented in a way. By the way, Monique, uh, is, she's still flying every morning this year and uh, making an enormous effort to try and, 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 uh, and uh, help find new formations, you know. She's, she's amazing. And she's also set up, last winter, she set up an information center in, in Holland, uh, the Crop Circle Center in Holland doing some wonderful work, uh, informing about the phenomenon and also discovering it, I must say, Monique. But there's been many flights lately where you haven't discovered anything. So we're wa waiting now for the big thing to happen. Uh, and then I want to tell you a little story that is not in my book because it just happened as my book came out last year. Uh, the Chair Hill Down Formation, no, the, yeah, the Chair Hill Down Formation. Um, the story is that these two Dutch people, Annemieke Lutz and Jan Willem van Kerk, they took off in two microlights. They flew parallel with pilot, pilots Tony Hughes, which you can see here, and Andy Jones. And they flew over Chair Hill Down approximately 10 minutes past, five minutes past 10. And there was nothing in the field then. There were two pilots and two uh, long time, or researchers who's been there for several years. They didn't see anything in that field. Uh, and then, um, on his next flight, pilot Andy Jones took off, uh, you know, the, it was a lesson with a, with a young student, and he took off the same way. They often fly over this field when they take off. And he sees suddenly there was a formation in the field. He was quite amazed because it was only, only 45 minutes had passed. And he, she was, the, the student was holding, the, what do you call them? She was flying for the first time, actually. So he was sitting next to her, and he was able to observe the fields quite closely. So he was very amazed, and, and he told uh, people as soon as he landed that there was a new formation. Now, so, uh, someone might think that to make a simple circle like that in four, 40 minutes wouldn't be any problem, but it looked very special on the ground. The lay was amazing. It was going in and out in big loops like this, and it looked incredible on the ground, the continuous flow of the stalks in and out of these loops. So to, to believe that anyone can do something like that in 10 minutes is, uh, you know, it's completely impossible. No, in 45 minutes, it's completely impossible. And then, amazingly, this year as well, uh, there's a story, uh, a similar story in, um, very, in, a in a field very close. The, the, the Aitsbury airstrip is over here, and the, the chair who down formation was down the hill here. And then something has happened this year in this field. Uh, which, is, which is not chair wheel down, sorry, this is wrong. It should be null down, sorry. And the photograph, this photograph is, is a video, is still of a video that Monique took while she was flying on June 26th at n about 9.30 in the morning. And you can clearly see there is no formation. It is in this section of the field. That's where it was going to happen. This time, it was a young man called Bart Klein Birmink who was flying with a pilot called Julian Midder. Julian Midder, sorry. He, they flew over Null Down at about 10 minutes past 11, and there was nothing in the field. But then they came back at 11.40, and then there was this little formation, which you might not think is very impressive, but again, it was very beautiful on the ground. It was in, in green barley. And here you hear Bart is sitting in the formation. He just he went straight from the, 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 the airfield and over to the formation and, and, and to visit it on the ground. So here also we have a window of about 45 minutes for a formation to have appeared. Uh, by the way, the, the, the pilots at the Yatesbury were flying several times over that field uh, after Monique flew it, and they say they saw nothing until this discovery. And also, on the ground, there were amazing things, you know, all the bent nodes, uh, which were lying, you know, they were not coming up like this uh, into the air, but they were lying bent, in, down bent in this manner. I think my time is running out. I have to be a bit quicker now. I also wanted to show you one formation from this year, which is, um, which is worth having a closer look at, the one at Barclay Lane, close to Foon in Somerset happened the 17th of June. And it was a simple formation uh, with some 
simple pattern elements. A few days after it had happened, this, this, this drawing um, was posted on uh, Johan Anderson's, or it was posted on the Popso uh, Connector Facebook page by Johan Anderson, a Swedish person. Um, and he pointed out that these two circles defined a 22-sided two, polygon in the ring of the formation. That was quite amazing. And then um, Bert Janssen made a comment on the Facebook group saying, hmm, 22 is an exciting number. I always uh, notice when that number comes up. And then um, Michael Glickman, uh, Johan Andersen sent you this uh, drawing, didn't he, Michael? Um, and you continued looking at the formation uh, and discovered something quite remarkable. Inside this little, you know, in the standing crop in the middle here, this little circle defines a seven-pointed star, which means the number seven is also there. And you could probably explain this, this much better than I, Michael, but the numbers seven and 22, you, it makes you think of pi, don't they? It's the sort of the, the almost exact pi numbers. Uh, and uh, you should go to Michael Glickman's website, the new one, michaelglickmanoncropcircles.com, and read the full blog about this formation and other pi formations. It's really worth reading. Do you want to add anything, Michael? No? No? no I'm no expert, you know, of, of geometry and mathematics, so there might be more things to say, but do, do read the, the Michael's full story. I would like to, to read a little passage from the book for you, because I think it's quite uh, uh, important. Uh, what I said in the beginning, you know, with, our, with, with the way we look upon the world as a material thing, and we look and how science look upon the world. There was a big discussion in the forum of the Norwegian Crop Circle website uh, a couple of years ago, and then there was very, you know, many silly comments, uh, but there was this suddenly this wonderful uh, posting. Wait a second. Um, uh, it was by, it was saying, you know, just how science cannot tell us everything important, uh, cannot explain everything. He was saying it cannot explain art, um, uh, beauty, poetry, human consciousness, religious experiences, mystical experiences, paranormal phenomena, phenomena uh, uh, nor the intrinsic value of nature, nor what life is, nor why the world is here, nor the meaning of existence, uh, and certainly not the crop circles. That is what this man said. And then I became really curious, you know, who is this person? So I, I wrote to him and said, uh, please, who are you? Can, you? can you say something more about this? And it turned out he is a professor of music at the university in Oslo. And he's written a book about the mysteries of music. And he's saying in his book, I'm, I'm quoting him in, in my book, uh, imagine this, an, an image he's saying, an, an auditorium full of concert goers. Some experience the music as a moving and truthful and shaking experience. Others notice little or nothing and go home unaffected. The music played was the same for all, but the listeners have different abilities to hear. Who says that the unaffected ones are right? We need an openness and re receptivity in us in order to experience music. We almost need faith. The music demands a, metamorpho oh, sorry, a metamorphosis within the listener, but it's not a subjective experience. It's an intersubjective one amongst all of those who are moved. In some way or other, the crop circles relate interactively with the human mind which, is, which is encounter them. They are probably nearer to humanistic sciences art appreciation, depth psychology, and mystical experience than to the supposedly objective natural science, sciences. They're not opposed to scientific understanding, as shown in their, by their geometrical, mathematical, energetic, and biological aspects, but they go beyond this understanding and demand alternative approaches as well. So I 
I thought I would finish with that. <laughs> The main, the main role is, is uh, the main character is then to, to travel out into the universe because there are instructions in this signal to build a big machine and we assume it is uh, uh, to send people, being, you know, it's to, um, its function is to send people out into the universe in a capsule. And so this uh, main character uh, is, uh, is doing that, but from our perspective she goes nowhere. The whole thing, the whole machine is a big failure. Uh, nothing happens. Uh, the, the capsule doesn't go anywhere. And, uh, but when she comes back, she's a scientist, she's an astronomer. She's telling about the most amazing experiences. She went for a long journey through the universe, through wormholes. And uh, everyone is just you know, shaking their heads, looking at each other and saying, okay, now she's gone nuts. So uh, she then has to realize, as a scientist, that she's made some kind of spiritual journey or maybe, um, maybe uh, a, a journey in, in, other, in other dimensions or other, in, a, in another existence in a way. And uh, it, it makes uh, life real tough for her, but she's, she sticks to what she's experienced and uh, uh, finally they, they sort of believe her and start sending other people also on the same journey. And that is the, the start for humanity, an, a new beginning for humanity in a way. So I, I sort of feel that applies to the crop circles as well. You know, that, that they are sending us on a journey that we cannot, we cannot really figure out what it is if we only look at, uh, uh, at the crop circles in a physical manner, trying to, that is, it is interesting, studying them on the ground, looking at the patterns and, and so on, try to figure it out. But there is something, there is something uh, else going on as well with us when we look into the crop circles uh, by that time. Because if we get that, if or when we get that answer, I think our way of looking upon ourselves and the universe and our place in the universe will totally have changed. Will have changed so much that questions like that will be, seem uh, silly in a way. So, um, I have the feeling that the, the crop circles uh, uh, are there in a way to show us that we are something else than more than we think and the universe is different than we think and our place in the universe is different than we think and far, far more greater than we can imagine now. And um, I'll get back to that a little bit at the end of the talk. So in, um, in 2010, I came out with a book in Norwegian uh, because everyone was asking me when I was lecturing in Norway, isn't there anything we can read about the crop circles in Norwegian? So I decided to, well actually I came out with a small book first in 2004, but it, that was much too small and simple, people wanted to read more. So I came out with this bigger book, uh, which is actually this one in 2010. And then I realized with all the work I'd put into it that it is a bit silly that it's only available to the Scandinavian uh, readers. And I decided to have it published in English and I actually found a publisher, Wessex Books. So that was very nice. Um, the reason why I'm showing you the Norwegian cover is for the crop circle that is on that cover. I insisted that we had that one on the cover at the time, but the English publisher wanted a newer one. But when I came, that crop circle was in the field next to Windmill Hill in, in 
I think it arrived the 30th of June 2006. And I was then still in Norway, and I saw this wonderful formation. And, and I'll, at the end of the lecture, I'll read a little passage from the book, and so we'll get back to that. Uh, even one more wormhole design appeared in 2006. Or at least, that's, it, it, they weren't as typical as, as the first one. <coughs> first ones, but everyone assumed they, it was a wormhole design as well. And then I stumbled across, as I was writing my book, I stumbled across uh, um, a drawing, a, des a design that looked very much like this, and that it that was a four-dimensional thorus, I was told. A thorus, uh, uh, we'll get back to that. This is the thorus, uh, a, a donut. Um, I, I saw that drawing in a book, and not this one, uh, but I went to a website. Uh, I, I finally found it on the internet, and it turned out that this design had to do with a thorus. Because if we try to imagine that we can creep inside the thorus, inside a donut, it will look a little bit like this. And if that is folded out, made flat, that's the design you get. This is from a, a website about a, a mathematical website called Brown um, Mathematics Brown dot um, edu education. I think it's it's uh, I refer to it in my book. So that I was very amazed. This was a few years afterwards. That that is probably what that pattern was referring to. And I'm no mathematician, so I, I cannot really explain to you what a four-dimensional thorus is, but maybe someone can pick this up and, and look at it a bit closer. But it certainly reminds, it reminds a lot, doesn't it? It is quite similar to this one. But there's something in the middle here um, on the internet, and I thought, wow, I'm really looking forward to go and see that when, when I go to England in a few days. I came over in, in the beginning of July, like I normally do, and then it was cut. It had been cut after only, I think, two days after it came. And I was so, it was so sad. And I stayed in, in Avery Truslow also, so it was close to where I was staying. And I went up to visit it anyway, and I sat in the sad remains of it, the stubble on the ground there, and I made sort of a, a, a prayer or a meditation, and I said, please, couldn't we have this one again, please? I would so much like <laughs> to, to see it. And then uh, a couple of days passed, <laughs> and this happened at Savannah Forest. And I was, I was really amazed, that because I, it has the same components, doesn't it? And I thought, wow. It was, was sort of an answer. But then only a couple of days after that, this came as well <laughs> at Auburn. And um, then I was quite convinced that, yes, thank you. I was allowed to, to, to really experience and see this pattern for real anyway, not only on a photograph. And it is, um, these designs were referred to as wormhole designs. And uh, there was a lot of, oh, we, we talked a lot about it back then in 2006. Why are they repeating these wormhole designs this year? And um, I don't know if any of you have seen the film Contact, based on the novel by, by um, uh, what's his name again? Uh, Carl Sagan, yes. It's a wonderful book, and, and, and the film is amazing. Uh, it is about uh, uh, a signal coming in, you know, being, being um, received here at Earth from, from, from beings in outer space, and uh, the, the I'm working full-time as a teacher in Norway. I was absolutely hooked by the crop circles in 1996. That's when I started looking into it. And I came down here to England to see the first crop circles here in 1999. And after that, I've, I've pretty much been here every year. Um, let's see. Um, I'll start with telling you about the only crop circle I ever discovered from the air. <laughs> Uh, I am flying to take a few aerials uh, when I can, just for the thrill of it. 
um, but once in 2008, I was flying to photograph a crop circle near West Woods, to the south of West Woods. Then I saw there was something in the field to the, the north of West Woods, and um, we flew over there, and it was this formation. And um, I think I was certainly the first one to see it from the air, and I might have been the first one in it as well. And looking at the photographs afterwards, I got this strange feeling, you know, that there were four eyes looking at me, and I, 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 this sentence came to me, under four eyes with the crop circles. Is that an expression in English as well, under four eyes with someone? It means sort of an intimate conversation in, uh, in Norwegian. Um, so, um, sometimes, um, you know, when people ask me all the time when I hold lectures in Norway, they ask me who are making the who or what are making the crop circles and, and how and, and why. And uh, sometimes I'm saying that if we ever get the answer to that question, who or what is making the crop circles and, and why, um, I think we will have totally forgotten the question. Uh, 